Well, good evening and welcome to the live stream. And a uh, very interesting conversation tonight, 20th of April 2021. And uh, got a lot of people already, got a lot of questions. I have a senator ready to go, so let me just quickly run through my critical points. This isn't financial advice, of course. We don't uh, uh, put specific stuff out there, but we do talk generally. Um, please play nice in the chat room. We are actually moderating the stream. This is as at the 20th of April 2021. If you want to get my attention, please use at Walk the World. And if you also want to make a contribution, you can via Super Chat or make sure that your question is firmly at the top of the list by using the Super Chat facility. I'm just going to bring you in, Senator. So uh, stand by, on and joined. Hello. How are you, Martin? I'm very good. And thank you very much for uh, spending some time with us tonight. And uh, <laughs> it's always fun when the technology doesn't quite do what you want it to do first back. But we got there. So uh, yeah, th no, th th thank th you. Th thank you. Good. And uh, look, uh, there are so many things that I want to chat with you about uh, tonight, um, particularly, of course, um, following your recent um, uh, estimates outing. And I did make a show, I don't know whether you saw, when I uh, put up uh, Meet the Senator who quizzed the RBA, right? We got 7,000 uh, views to that since last Saturday. So that's pretty good. That was the segment that you actually um, uh, did with Guy de Bell there. Um, and I've got lots and lots of questions. But I think a good place to start, Senator, is... Just a bit about you, because some people may not know uh, your bit about your background. And my observation is you haven't come through necessarily the typical political route. Uh, and maybe, therefore, you have a slightly different perspective on things. So can we start there? Yeah, sure. Sure, Martin. Um, well, look, long story short, uh, I was born 50 years ago in a town in Western Queensland, small town, 3,000 people, called Chinchilla. I uh, did my schooling there until the last two years. I went away to boarding school. Uh, then went on to the University of Queensland where I got a Bachelor of Commerce, uh, graduated in 1990, which was the 11% unemployment uh, recession. I mean, it's interesting, you know, now we get worried if unemployment 6 to 7%. Back then it was 11%. Uh, so I had three years working in public practice at a firm in Dolby, which was actually very, very good experience. Uh, after that, I went overseas for what I thought would be two years, had seven years overseas. Um, five of those years were working and two of those years were backpacking. Uh, the two years in London I had were with BBC and British Rail. I had three years based out of Amsterdam with a multinational there where I did a variety of roles um, across the world, financial controlling, internal auditing, uh, systems implementation, said shared service implementation. Uh, came back to Australia when I was 30, had almost seven years with the Bank of Queensland in management accounting, uh, finance implementation, uh, mainframe implementation and treasury accounting and securitisation. So that's, and that's when I did my masters of uh, finance. And then uh, I went to Westfield for seven years where I worked um, in treasury accounting um, and then went and did my masters of tax law down there as well. And it, I, I guess it was when I did my masters of tax law at Sydney uh, University. And I just saw there were a lot of things in the tax act that I felt didn't really, uh, weren't fair to Australian businesses. There were a lot in, a lot of incentives in the tax act for um, uh, foreign investment that, in my view, made it very difficult for Australian business to compete. I mean, it's hard enough as it is for Australian business to compete at the best of times, but when your own government has legislated um, against you, uh, it's even harder. So that was probably the thing that where I felt I could add value uh, if I got into politics. Um, so I sort of... Uh, you know, got to the point where we had our first child. We moved back to Brisbane. I had a couple of roles um, up here, contract roles. Uh, one of the last ones was with a multinational where I trained um, people in other countries to do our statutory reporting. Um, and I just felt like this outsourcing has to stop as well. I just thought that, you know, multinationals are working against us as well. So I ran for politics out of frustration and, and effectively a desire I guess, for Australia to regain its own sovereignty in, in a number of areas, whether it be, you know, our own taxation sovereignty, monetary policy sovereignty, you know, we over-rely on foreign capital, we over-rely on foreign manufacturing. Um, and, and one of the, you know, quotes that I use or one of the, I guess, um, inspirations that I use is I, there's a book called The Prince by Machiavelli and in Chapter 12 and 13 of that book, he talks about, he laments the, the loss of power of the Italian states 
because they rely too much on mercenaries and auxiliaries to do everything. And as a result, they pretty much lost you know, their own sovereignty. And I feel in many ways today, Australia has become a, a vassal state of multinational corporations. Uh, you know, we seem to, uh, you know, pretty much, you know, for the last 30, 40 years followed the neoliberal agenda, which is, you know, to me, not really served Australian interests, uh, especially in regards to privatisation. Um, and yeah, so long story short, that's I guess why I wanted uh, wanted to run for politics. But yeah, if, if I could give a bit more of a high level reason as well, um, you know, look, I want to make sure our children get the same opportunities as our forefathers gave to us. The story of Australia, modern day Australia, is an incredible one. Um, our, our pioneering forefathers made a lot of sacrifices to get Australia to where it is today. And number two, I want to make sure I stand up for Australians who stand up for themselves. Uh, we have to make sure that we always reward, reward people, um, you know, who, who go to work and put their nose to the grindstone every day. And number three, I want to make sure it's the role of government to provide essential services. In my view, we've outsourced all those, we've sold all the infrastructure that provides essential services, especially state governments, but the federal governments, both parties, by the way, this is not trying to be political here, have sold, um, you know, infrastructure that provides essential services. And effectively in the last 30 years, governments have just walked on into the family home, the classroom, the bedroom, telling people how to live their individual lives uh, rather than do those macro responsibilities that individuals can't do, uh, like build dams, build power stations, roads uh, and, and things like that to make sure, and vaccines, CSLs, great example, uh, that people can't do. I mean, I don't know about you, but I pay my taxes in return for essential services, not for regulation. Or, or, you know, what I'd call over-the-top regulation and inefficient regulation. So that, that in a nutshell, is sort of why I ran and my background. Terrific. And, uh, you know, what I find fascinating and refreshing is your perspective that, um, you know, it's down to businesses, it's down to individuals, it's down to communities to do things. And um, it sounds to me as though your perspective is that um, government should be there to enable and facilitate rather than actually dictate and and control firstly and secondly your alignment to you know real businesses in real locations in australia rather than the big multinationals who seem to be frankly calling the shots yeah absolutely um and look yeah w w we are there to enable but we also have a role to provide a safety net so it, it's important like i don't i don't believe that the market should rip um and ironically enough if you read robert menzies forgotten people speech he actually says in the last paragraph we should not go back to the old and selfish notions of laser fair um, which I always say that to some of my Liberal Party colleagues and they're quite stunned that Robert Menzies said that. Um, and they'll often say to me, well, why are you in the Liberal Party? And I'll say, because ultimately I'm a capitalist and that's someone who risks, you know, it doesn't matter what sort of capital they risk, whether it's financial, uh, whether they're a small business, whether they're a doctor or a nurse or an engineer, you know, it can be, uh, you know, their hands, it can be labour. If they're putting their nose to the grindstone every day, they're the people we have to protect. Um, and, and encourage so that you know they can lift Australia and keep Australia moving forward. Um, so, and, and and the other thing about corporations, and I quoted this in my maiden speech from Adam Smith's um, Wealth of Nations, I think it was. He was actually against corporations because he didn't like the fact that they got to manage other people's me uh, money. And he said, you know, negligence will always prevail. And the corporation and their limited liability actually then puts in an asymmetrical risk reward paradigm within the market. So, you know, often these companies, I'll talk about free markets and the banks are classic examples, but they're given a social licence. They're given a social licence and, and it shouldn't be, just be a case of, you know, we've got to protect those guys. They only exist because of the people, the individuals out there, the Australian people and the Australian workers who go and earn a living and actually then spend that money. So it, it, it's a bit of, you know, I, I believe in small business. I believe in those people who put their nose to the grindstone every day. But once you get into those big corporations, a lot of those guys are given a social licence and they've got an obligation not to shaft the little guy. And so I guess the question I've got is, if you think back over what's happened um, recently, we've had liquidity injection of $200 billion plus from the Reserve Bank plus another $95 billion going to the banks on the term funding facility. We've yes. had a lot of uh, money thrown at the big end of town through, through COVID. Um, and I guess my question is, to what extent do you think the economy currently is functioning as that sort of capitalist economy? And to what extent do you think it's gone sort of hooked around the corner? 
Uh, well, look, I mean, in the last 12 months, you know, we, we've all, you know, for all intents and purposes, been a, a socialist economy where it, it's government spending that's held the economy up. Uh, and, you know, we, we need to get out of that fast and get back to, uh, you know, an enterprise system where reward for effort is uh, rewarded rather than, you know, paying people to stay at home uh, indefinitely. So, but, and, and I guess this, you know, we'll jump straight into the, the pointy edge here uh, of where we've got to, what we've got to reform first. I mean, I, I, I focus on three major reforms, monetary policy, taxation reform and federation reform. Um, I'll focus on monetary policy first for two reasons. I think that's the topic of tonight's um, uh, blog, but also I think it's the easiest thing to do. And the, easy, and the reason why I think it's the easiest thing to do is that it's the most misunderstood area of government uh, policy and government reform. One of the things that we, we have been taught all our lives in the finance sector is that you can't... Um, quantitative easing is a bad thing. Now... It is, it can be, and it's very risky, but at the same time, governments as sovereign countries, sovereign nations, have the power to match sovereign credit with sovereign wealth. Okay, so if you go and print and spend, that's bad. That'll increase demand, it'll increase inflation, it encourages uh, bad behaviour, uh, moral hazard. Don't advocate that for a minute. But what I do advocate is governments using their sovereign credit to build infrastructure. Now, there's probably 10 asset classes, you know, you can give or take a few, but obviously, you know, dams, power stations, ports, railways, roads, um, airports, fuel refineries, you know, I, I think there's possibly a case for that to be a sovereign responsibility, certainly here in Australia, given that we're, you know, an isolated country at the bottom of the South Pacific. Um, so we need to get the RBA, if they can spend $200 billion on, on printing money to bail us out of COVID and another $95 billion, but I think the limit's up to $200 billion on that term funding facility, um, why can't we, you know, then go and invest another two or $300 billion in two things? Number one, buying back our infrastructure and number two, building more infrastructure. Um, so, yeah, and I'm, and I'm happy to elaborate on that further um, as we go yeah. along. Just a quick question. Um, would the post office be on your list? The post office shouldn't be privatised, um, and I definitely support regional services, uh, regional banking being put in the post office. Um, so, look, the post office is a, an essential service, uh, and, you know, it's got to stay in government hands. Uh, you know, and, and there's competition out there now anyway with other... Cause, you know, it's not so much envelopes and mail anymore as opposed to parcels. I think that's the big driver of, um, uh, you know, uh, postal services today. So, um, yeah, a a absolutely, the post office should exist. I mean, it already exists and, and all we need is, is good management to ensure that it's success going forward. I'm not sure the post offices should be in the role of um, selling magazines. I, I did have a bit of an issue with that last year, late last year, earlier this year, where there was a bit of a trial run and, I've got, uh, you know, I've got some feedback from news agents that was going to destroy their business. So I'm not into necessarily selling news, uh, sorry, uh, magazines uh, and, and pushing news agents out. But mm. in terms of delivering mail, absolutely, and banking services. If, yeah. Right. I was going to pick up on that because it's interesting. Um, you know, ANZ is the one leading the way at the moment in with the withdrawal of, of banking service from regional Australia. The other banks are also following. So the last person standing are those local post offices. And it seems to me that they are, if you like, the last bastions of commercial capability that need to be there to enable those co regional communities to continue to thrive. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I'm from a small town of 3,000 people myself, uh, and I would totally agree with you uh, that we need post offices uh, in the regions and, and they need to be a one-stop shop for all government services, mm. yeah, and, no, and, including I'm, banking services. Oh, I mean, I, I would actually like... I mean. You know, all of this, you know, the Royal Commission into financial reform and everything like that, my my preference would be just to have a Commonwealth Bank that we used to have for retail banking and, and business banking, and that wouldn't that wouldn't be funded via um, quantitative easing. That would just be borrow, you know, at three and lend at six, so, so to speak. I hope those interest rates were a bit out of date now, of course. But um, uh, so I, I'm not against that either because, interestingly enough, 
I think when the Commonwealth Bank was privatised, and I'll stand to be corrected on this, it was more business banking than retail banking. Um, and, you know, our, our business guys have really suffered uh, in terms of access to credit, and that's an area that we really need to, to make um, speed up and, and make more easily available to Australian businesses. Mm. Well, it's very interesting, and uh, I think there's a lot of support on the chat, actually, for uh, some of the things that you're saying, particularly with regard to... Uh, supporting small business and, and, and regional centres. Now, let's shift the conversation slightly forward because, uh, you know, it's only quite recently that the Reserve Bank has been in front of the Senate in, in I think it's, what, two or three sessions? That, that um, So my first question is, why did that happen? And um, what was your reaction when the deputy rocked up rather than Phil Lowe himself for the, for the last set of questions and answers? Well, look, I'm not actually, I apologise for my ignorance, maybe I should have known this. I've only been a senator for just under two years and I've only done three lots of estimates. Uh, and I think they've been at all the estimates that I've attended. So I didn't realise that it was the first time around. Um, but I, I'm glad they do come. Unfortunately, I feel as though we don't get enough time. Uh, and, and that's I can say that for all bureaucracies um, at Senate estimates. If it was left to me, like we have 19 sitting weeks a year, and that includes four weeks of estimates. If it was left to me, I'd spend more like 26 to 30 weeks in Canberra a year as a poly because, as I say to my constituents here in Queensland, I can't solve your problems up here. I've got to be in Canberra to solve them. That's where the decision-making processes are made. Now, admittedly, it's up to the ministers to solve a lot of problems, but in terms of holding our government and bureaucrats to account, I personally need a lot more than four weeks a year to do that. I mean, we go from 9 o'clock in the morning to 11 o'clock at night, and often we're pushed back or we're rushed or, you know, I know a few times I didn't even get a chance to ask the questions directly. And I've had opportunities to put questions on notice, but unfortunately the replies to those questions on notice are never as thorough as if you can actually sit there and go face to face with the RBA. Um, back to the RBA specifically, yep, they should be at Senate estimates all the time. Um, I, I feel that would probably be the most important role that's been outsourced by uh, government. I personally don't like the fact that unelected bureaucrats, nothing against, you know, the guys at the RBA personally, um, but I don't like the fact that un in fact unelected bureaucrats are in charge of our monetary policy. Now, people will say, oh, you know, but if politicians were in charge, they'd just lower interest rates, and that was the original argument. Well, guess what? They lowered interest rates anyway. They took the easy option out. Um, and quite frankly, I think their understanding of finance and monetary policy was pretty poor. And when I say they, I'm not talking just about the RBA, but the, about the, world, the Western world's central banks uh, in general. Uh, they've taken the very easy option of just lowering interest rates. Then they went straight to quantitative easing, but they didn't actually, they weren't smart about quantitative easing. They were actually foolish in my view, where they just print and spend um, rather than print and build. As I say to people, if you went to a desert island, would you either A, go to a bank or B, look to control the means of production. And, you know, the reality is we know the answer to that was you look to control the means of production. And that's, interestingly enough, what who I call the founding father of Australia, Lachlan Macquarie, he knew that when he came to Australia, that, you know, he was probably the first governor to see Australia as a potential country. He knew it needed to have its own currency, hence the issue of the holy dollar. Um, and he used that holy dollar to build infrastructure in Sydney town and some of that infrastructure is still there, those old buildings. Um, ironically enough today, of course, it's Macquarie Bank that uses the Holy Dollar as its logo and it owns a lot of uh, what are public infrastructure or bought a lot of public infrastructure and now clips the ticket on that. And that's a great business model because infrastructure will last 100, 150 years. So, you know, you just up the price of the ticket by 1% or 2% every year and, you know, compounding inflation or compounding interest, you know, they make a lot of money over the long term. Yeah, absolutely. Now, well, let me. Just, <laughs> I want to sort of look at the mandate of the Reserve Bank, right? This is actually the thing that's on their wall, right? And the Reserve Bank there is to contribute to the stability of the currency, the maintenance of full employment, and the economic prosperity and welfare of the people of Australia. So, Senator, what do you regard as their success rate in terms of meeting that mandate, at firstly? And secondly, is that mandate right? Uh, very, it's hard for that mandate to be wrong because it's very broad, what I'd consider broad. 
Um, I'd question the stability of the currency last year. I mean, I admit last year was a bit of an exception, but we did go as low as 55 cents, and then we almost ended the year at 80 cents. Now, unless you're a big corporation with a treasury desk, a lot of businesses would have struggled with the volatility of the dollar throughout the year on top of other you know, issues as well, COVID issues. Um, I've always been very wary. I feel like when we've floated the dollar, and I'm not saying we shouldn't, shouldn't have done it, but I feel as though our currency is at the uh, whim of foreign speculators rather than genuine um, domestic producers. And I think the dollar's actually been valued a bit too high um, for a bit too long. I think it should be in the low 60s if we're to be genuinely competitive. Um, so, look, you could say before COVID the dollar had been fairly stable for a long time. Um, whether or not it was priced right, I, I, I slightly disagree. I think it could have been 10 or 20% lower. Um, but that's not the big issue. The big issue was the health of the economy. Now, let's get real. The biggest cost of anyone's household budget is the, is the cost of accommodation. So... Uh, um, house prices have risen, you know, I think on average by 7% for the last 30 years. The cost of housing isn't included, you know, existing houses isn't included in the inflation figure. Um, and whether you like it or not, the purchasing power of the average wage today is not as much as what it was 30 years ago, if you were to include the cost of housing. And I believe, um, with perhaps the exception of one or two other issues that I won't go into right now, um, the cost of housing is the biggest issue, economic issue facing um, Australia going forward. Uh, and it's not just an e e economic issue, it will become a social issue as time goes on uh, because a roof over everyone's head, I mean, that's as basic as it gets. Um, and I think we run the risk of creating a two-tiered society if we have the haves and the haves not in terms of who owns a house and who doesn't. Um, I will slightly qualify that by saying we we there are a lot there's a lot of cheap housing out in the regions or there was 12 months ago it's gotten a lot more expensive in the last 12 months uh, and some of these problems could be solved if we could get younger people to move to the regions where I know from traveling around regional Queensland there is a lot of demand for workers um, and you know we need to find a way to not only get people into housing but get them prepared to move to the regions where there's a lot of opportunity out there and there's a lot of untapped wealth uh, that with a combination of the right housing policy, uh, income policy and you know, infrastructure policy, I think we can solve those problems uh, or go a long way to solving them. They'll never be perfect, but um, yeah. And this interesting question came in on the uh, super chat. Um, would you push for macro controls to level the playing field between first home buyers and investors? For example, genuine savings history, not paper equity, a bit like what New Zealand has introduced. Uh, I'm not sure what New Zealand's introduced. I'm on the record as saying I think there should be capital gains tax on domestic, on, on housing above $2 million, on sales above $2 million. Uh, that would exclude... I think around 95% of the people from paying any capital gains tax. I think, you know, and I mean, I'm happy to, you know, maybe it might be two and a half given that rate of inflation. But the idea is we need to bring that in now. I would happily abolish CGT, uh, the 50% CGT discount, you know, on, on residential property. Uh, I, I think there's an asymmetrical risk factor there where the losses you can get 100%. Um, tax offset, but the gains are only taxed at fifty percent. So just go back to indexation um, uh, as we used to prior to the ninety nine uh, Ralph review. I think it came in it was at ninety nine two thousand a fifty percent discount on um, residential. Uh, sorry, on investment property, and obviously then the cap. Uh, the primary place of residence was always exempted when Keating brought in CGT in eighty five. Um, and, and by all means, like for people, the average income earner who buys a house for 600 and sells for 800 or 900, 30 years later, fine. You know, we don't want to tax that, but we just need to keep a lid on it at that higher end of town. I mean, I have to tell you, I, I personally don't like the fact, I don't think we've got an equitable uh, country when someone who earns $50,000 has to pay $6,000 income tax and we're going to have people selling, you know, mansions at Point Piper and making millions of dollars in capital gains tax and don't pay any tax. I, don't, I just don't think that's fair. 
And along with superannuation, that CGT um, discount or, or exemption on primary place of residence is the biggest cost of the budget in terms of a loophole. It's about 50, it's estimated to cost about $50 billion. Um, and even if, you know, we just clipped the ticket on houses sold above $2 million and it picked up $5 billion, well, that could, you know, give an income tax cut to the low income earners. Yeah, very interesting. And just on New Zealand, there were three things which I think have changed recently. Firstly, the, the Reserve Bank in New Zealand now has to consider home prices specifically when they think about their monetary policy, where, of course, in yeah. Australia, the Reserve Bank says nothing to do with us, and as does APRA, we'll come back to that. Secondly, they've uh, increased the hurdles when it comes to um, the proportion you need to make to, to put in as a deposit, particularly for investors. And yeah. thirdly, they've tightened up on the tax gains. In other words, you have to hold the product for a lot longer before you can actually avoid capital gains tax if you sell. So they've tried to tilt the playing field a bit more towards first-time buyers rather than towards investors. But I think of the three, making the Reserve Bank of New Zealand consider specifically home prices as part of their mandate, a really big shift. And I actually think that's something which, frankly, I think we should be thinking about here too. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and I think in, when I questioned uh, the RBA in estimates, they sort of brushed off the responsibility towards housing. But I don't see how they could do that because housing is such a big part of the economy and, and of uh, individuals' budgets. So reg yeah, if you're paying rent or if you're paying off a mortgage, I mean, that's generally the largest cost in your expense budget. And the other issue we should touch on is when they lowered rates to 1% or 0.1%, uh, they've destroyed retiree incomes as well. So that's not only, I mean, that's kind of made the whole point of superannuation um, redundant because all those people that had money in super now, they've, you know, who wanted to retire, say, on a fixed income of 4 or 5% fixed income and not have to worry about the volatility in the equity market, they've, they're all forced to have their money in shares now. So, you know, propping up the stock market now has become almost a national security issue because, God forbid, the stock market would ever crash, we'd wipe out everyone's savings. Um, so that's that's another issue, and, and lowering interest rates to 0.1 percent also impacts how much pension we pay out on the income test. So this is where you know they say, well, no, it's got to be independent from government, but their decisions has impacted how much money we, the government and the taxpayer, has to fund in terms of transfer payments for the pension. Um, so you know we, we, the, the decisions that the RBA make have to be borne by. Uh, the people. And, and you know, I come back to this, we're supposed to live in a democracy where elected members are accountable and yet we've outsourced accountability um, to unelected officials. I, I, I seriously, you know, this is one of the frustrating things I've found in my role is that we've outsourced a large part of decision making um, to unelected bureaucrats. And, and you might like politicians, but at least you, A, you get to vote us out every three years and B, there is some level of transparency um, whereas with bureaucrats, you can never get to vote them out. And, and there is a very uh, small amount of transparency, in my view, at the best of times. I mean, I've asked a lot of questions on estimates, uh, on notice at estimates. And, you know, the, the amount of success I've had in getting the answers that I'm looking for or, or what I would expect have, has been very poor. Um, so, yeah, no, the RBA, I, I do like those changes proposed by the New Zealand um, government. And so um, it's interesting. We had... We've had two financial system reviews in recent times. We had the Wallace and then we had the Murray inquiry. Both of those effectively redlined the Reserve Bank, so they weren't included in the reviews. In fact, the last time was way, way back. Um, do you think we need um, a review of the role of the Reserve Bank and its effectiveness? Absolutely. And I, 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 you know, I'd almost go further and say I think that the responsibility for monetary policy needs to come back within Parliament. I, I, I just don't... I mean, would you outsource the tax office setting the tax rate, income tax rate? I mean, that's what we've effectively done with monetary policy. Uh, and no one ever ever has really questioned it until maybe recently at least. Uh, but um, I, I think we do need a review and I think there needs to be a lot more parliamentary oversight of monetary policy. 
Right. And that, of course, has interesting consequences because the, the argument earlier on was, well, you can't leave monetary policy to the politicians because they'll mess around with it too much, right? Um, on the other hand, the Reserve Bank, who basically seems to me has no accountability for what they do and are able to say, well, nothing to do with us. And by the way, let me just put this chart up. This is actually their inflation target, right? This is their forecast versus what actually happened. So they were way, way off. They have been pretty inaccurate for a long, long period of time. And you can, by the way, say the same of Treasury with employment. Uh, you know, wherever you look, you, you see these sort of mishits. So something is a bit structurally weird at the moment in terms of people seem to be able to, uh, you know, set things off um, and yet take no accountability when the results don't come in close to what they said they were going to be. Absolutely. T totally agree. And, you know, without trying to get too far off the topic, it's the same federation as well. I mean, the, 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 the bingling between federal and state governments. Uh, as I was frustrated before I even ran in politics between state and federal um, relations and the vertical fiscal imbalance and the ambiguous responsibilities. But after the, you know, throughout this term with the bushfires and with COVID and with vaccines and quarantine, I really would like to have a constitutional convention and sort all this out. Um, and, and the same with the RBA. I mean, it, it, there is too much puck passing in this game. Full stop. And the other question is, of course, the Reserve Bank is very strongly connected to the Bank for International Settlements, which is, of course, the banker's uh, banker, right, as is all our central banks around the world. And I wonder whether you see groupthink emerging because they all sort of basically huddle together and then come back and deploy their policies in their own countries. Um, do you see that as a problem or do you think there is actually benefit in that sort of top-down um, dictation of, if you like, strategies? Uh, I see that as a big, big problem. Uh, and I've seen groupthink uh, in my field uh, in, in, in commerce uh, ever since, you know, I started studying at high school in the 80s. I'll, I'll never forget sitting in a university lecture um, up here at the University of Queensland in 1988 I can remember the moment very clearly where my lecturer explained to me the efficient market hypothesis and how the price, the share price had fully factored in information that was released to the market. And we would somehow expect that to believe that was efficient. Uh, and I can remember thinking at the time, no, that's just insider trading. Um, and we've seen it uh, in the Liberal Party, um, you know, this, this free market, we've seen it in the Labor Party. Um, I, I raised in, uh, uh, you know, privatisation and buying back our infrastructure uh, in a um, government in, uh, uh, backbench meeting. Uh, and one of the Labor guys said, well, what are superannuation funds going to buy if we, we buy back all the infrastructure? And I just thought to myself, well, it's not about in, super, superannuation isn't about buying infrastructure. That's about providing retirement. But the group think absolutely. And it's not just, I mean, it's not just in economics, it's it's in the world. I mean, if anyone questions anything about the narrative today, it is, you know, you, 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 know, you, you will cop it on social media, you'll get abuse. Um, uh, so, yeah, there is way too much groupthink. I mean, I can remember the fawning over Alan Greenspan in the 2000s when he, you know, had the Greenspan put and they thought he was a genius. Um, he was actually a hypocrite because he was against, you know, the, the manipulation of central banks, I believe, in the late 60s. Um, uh, and he was fawned upon. And as it turns out, I mean, he he helped instigate. He was in charge of the Federal Reserve and the Glass-Steagall Act was pulled apart by Clinton, um, you know, fueled the stock market bubble up until, um, you know, the GFC kicked in. Uh, and then, you know, he sort of disappeared off the face of the earth. But he, he, even now, like, I don't think we've really learned the lessons from the GFC, quite, quite amazingly. The banks have just got back in charge um, and uh, it's, you know, we've really got to stand up to these guys um, and we've got to stand up to groupthink. It's very difficult to stand up to groupthink. Um, uh, I, I tried at times on a few issues. Um, you have your good days and your bad days and some days you're just not up for the fight because there's only so much abuse you can take in your life. Um, but, yeah, groupthink is a problem. <clears throat> and if I think about the Reserve Bank, APRA and ASIC, right, my question yep. is, do you think those roles are clear and integrated? They're definitely not clear. A lot of buck passing. I think APRA should come back in within the RBA. I don't know. I mean, I'm sure they had good reasons for it when they split off. 
But I think APRA and the RBA should work together because prudential measures, uh, macro prudential measures, uh, and, and you know how much of a deposit and, and, and insurance and uh, all those sort of issues should should the RBA should be out watching as well. Um, I don't have a problem with ASIC being a, a, a different um, uh, body altogether. I do have a problem with their attitude. I don't know if you saw my questioning regarding the Bank of Queensland share offer, uh, but the treatment. This is another thing, you know, back in the 80s uh, when share issues were done, they were all pro-rated um, and renounceable so you could sell your shares. I mean, this is another re- uh, example of where the little guy's just been shafted. And, you know, this has all come about at, at, with the rise of the finance industry, rise of the fund managers. I mean, once upon a time, you probably had the big four. Now you've got the big four plus foreign banks plus, you know, these massive superannuation funds that have just so much... Um, uh, power, um, and, and and it's uh, it's it's a real worry. So definitely, APRA should come back in within RBA, in my view, and ASIC should be standalone, separate. But they need to protect shareholders' interests. That's it. That is their responsibility. Uh, it's not to protect the company themselves. The company is protected by the board. ASIC are protect meant to protect the shareholders and to ensure that the board doesn't shaft the shareholders. Um, and it's interesting because of course APRA tends to stand on the side of the big banks, it seems to me. So they have very little interest or indeed knowledge of individual customers' financial situation. And in fact, when they report loans, they just report them at an aggregate level, um, looking at it from a lender's perspective rather than from a, a borrower's perspective. So I guess my question is, who's looking after the interests of people who borrow from the banks or small businesses who borrow from the bank at the moment? Uh, look, I do know the answer to that. There is a there was a body set up that you can com- actually make complaints to, and it's free of charge. And I'll have to come. I'll text you. I'll get that answer tomorrow. That was one of the things out of the Royal Commission, and it was one of the actual. I felt was a good thing to come out of it. And it's it's not known. It's actually funded by a levy paid by the banks. Um, and for the life of me, it's it's some sort of finance. It's called something along the lines of. Uh, finance consumer complaints authority or something like that there is an authority out there and i have to admit i apologize for my ignorance i've only found out about it recently um when these proposed changes to consumer lending came in yeah uh, and just and just to, be, of, just to be clear individuals yeah. or small businesses can yeah. go and make a complaint if they feel that they've been handled badly and it's a result of the um the royal commission and it's it's a good it's a complaints authority right yeah. Um, but the, I guess the question is, structurally, um, they can deal with individual problems after the event, right? Yeah. But they can't deal with it more structurally when there's a sort of a system. Yeah, prevent it. Yeah, yeah. it's reactive yeah. rather than um, proactive or so, preventative. So, um, mm. so, so I'm, think, I'm thinking, for example, we know that the loan-to-value and, and loan-to-income ratios are going up again at the moment, so we're actually seeing a higher proportion of of, of higher risk loans than previously. This is actually the latest APRA data that shows that there's been quite a rise recently, right? And yet we've got APRA and the Reserve Bank saying there's nothing to see here. Well, the truth seems to me from the data that the risks are rising, and yet it doesn't seem to me that anybody wants to tackle that. And what we've got is that right at the end of the value chain, once people have tripped up and have then fallen over, is the complaints authority at the end. So it seems a fairly okay. weak... Yeah, sure. Yeah. Okay, so... so- that should be APRA's responsibility and they need to uh, have have the right um, benchmarks in there to ensure that we don't uh, end up with too much moral hazard or too much reckless lending. Um, I'd, I'd have to look at, you know, each example. So w- whether or not, you know, you're doing so, you've got to have a 20% deposit now, but then you've got to, and so you've got an 80% loan at say 1%. Well, I guess you'd have to stress test that. What could you, could the lender um, or the borrower, sorry, fund that mortgage if it went to 4%, you know, which is realistic in, in, in our lifetime that, you know, I mean, who knows what's going to happen, but 4 or 5%, you know, it, it's probable sometime in the next 30 years we'll get back to that rate, or at least I hope we do. Um, so, Without going into too much detail, APRA should be in charge of that and, you know, that they need to adjust. As interest rates come down, then that stress testing needs to get harder because obviously there's less downside in terms of interest rates, much more upside. 
So the weight of probabilities over a 30 year loan, you know, I think probably that's how they should stress test it is, well, what do we think the forward curve is going to be over the next 30 years? What's the average interest rate? And that should be the interest rate that they apply um, in terms of uh, uh, ability to pay the loan rather than um, the current interest rate. Mm. And of course, they didn't uh, apply counter cyclical buff, buff, buffers as rates came down. In fact, they were encouraging the banks to, to lend more. So I guess, you know, my, my sort of observation is it seems to me that the Reserve Bank and APRA are very much with Treasury saying lend more, lend more, lend more, because we've got to find a way to get out of our current uh, uh, dip. I just wonder whether we fully understand the consequences of the amount of credit that's being thrown out there and whether we're actually are digging a bigger hole for ourselves later. Yeah, it's classical short-term thinking that's dominated the market. And this is the downfall of the market. It's always uh, driven by short-term thinking, not long-term thinking. And my view is if you want to get the economy moving, why can't the government start building infrastructure and create jobs that way where you're actually being, you know, activity, it's productive activity, you're stimulating productive activity, um, you know, perhaps with measures to encourage onshore production, uh, that is what we should be doing if we want to stimulate the economy um, rather than, you know, encouraging just more spending for the sake of spending and, and inflating asset bubbles uh, that ultimately are going to end in tears um, if it's not handled correctly. And, you know, we can still get out of this, but it's got to be, you know, proper monetary policy designed to increase productivity through more infrastructure building and greater business lending. It shouldn't be greater consumer credit and housing lending. Right, and that joined up thinking is missing in action, it seems to me, at the moment. Yeah, I, I, I don't disagree. Um, mm. I, I'm personally trying very hard to get an infrastructure bank up and running. Right. Uh, um, uh, you know, with the purpose of, you know, uh, you know, as I said before, you know, building some more infrastructure. I mean, you know, we've gone in the last 20 years from a population of 19 million people to 20, almost 26 million people now, so we've increased by 30%. But we haven't had an increase in 30% of the infrastructure out there. We've had next to no dams built here in Queensland. Uh, we've sold our railway lines. I think we've had one or two stations added to the Brisbane Suburban Network. Um, it, it's pretty pathetic. Actually, there was an uh, article in the Weekend Australian about how the Pacific Highway has been completed uh, 40 years after the Kempsey accident, or 31 years, sorry, I think it was 1989, uh, bus accident. To think that it took us 30 years to build a, a dual highway between Brisbane and Sydney just goes to show um, our lack of commitment to infrastructure in the last 30 to 40 years. It's just, it's, it's pathetic. I mean, compared to China, and if you want to, you know, put one reason why China has been so successful and come out of the Cultural Revolution in 66, it's because they've used sovereign credit to fund sovereign infrastructure and, and untap their sovereign wealth. Um, so, you know, and, and we've got to do the same thing here. It's, it's you know, um, uh, if you look at what B. Ocky Peterson and Leo Hilscher did, who is his treasurer, they, they opened up a lot of uh, Queensland, built a lot of infrastructure. And the thing about that infrastructure is it provides recurring revenue to pay for recurring expenses like schools and hospitals. Um, so it, it's just a win-win on so many levels if you start building infrastructure Um uh, you know, you provide jobs, you provide more essential services, greater supply of essential services and business inputs will drive, well, in theory, should drive the price down of power, of water, you know, better transportation. And then you provide a revenue stream for governments uh, in lieu of extra taxation and, and a revenue stream that because it's monopoly and, and, and with, over time with inflation, um, it, it, it can help sort of pay for the cost of inflation rather than increasing taxes or, or, or God forbid, even worse, increasing foreign debt. Yeah, absolutely. Now, there's a question which sort of flows on from that, and that is the private banks at the moment, right, have capital requirements which are set by APRA, which in turn are set by the Bank for International Settlements. And if they lend for mortgages, the typical capital requirements is somewhere between 25 and 27 or 28, right? If they lend to small businesses, it's up to 100%. So there's a natural incentive to lend more to households for property compared with the productive business lending. So my question is, do you think that those international capital rules have helped or hindered in terms of trying to set the direction of the economy? Uh, well, I, I think they've hindered. Um, 
uh, I, I can understand why a private bank will obviously uh, be more conservative in business lending uh, and why that's why they stick to housing because housing is underwritten by, you know, land itself and a high immigration rate too high in my view um, and a very uh, generous RBA and, and regulatory settings that have always encouraged house prices to go up. Right, so you've just got what you call government backing for those loans, virtually. Um, uh, or, um, but this is yet again where I would argue that we need a Commonwealth Bank or an old form of Commonwealth Bank where the government can step in and provide business lending that, say, more risk adverse uh, banks uh, and who are looking for higher returns just won't lend on. And I'll extend that to uh, insurance offices as well. I mean, in North Queensland, they just find it so difficult to get insurance anymore because insurance companies won't provide insurance. Well, we used to have state government insurance offices, and, of course, what happened? They all got privatised. So, yet again, um, you know, people are out there screaming for insurances and, you know, some people can't get insurance at all or, so, or the cost of insurance is, is, is so prohibitive that... Uh, um, you know, they have to shut their business down. Absolutely. Yeah, it is a significant issue. I survey small businesses all the time, and uh, those are some of the things that come up. I can't get the, the credit that I need because yeah. I have to jump through too many hoops. Or, for example, I have to put my house on the line. Uh, and yeah. then, you know, insurance is way too expensive. And then, of course, the other issue that we, is that the, the job um, seeker program uh, sorry, the JobKeeper program supported the big end of town but didn't really provide that much support for a lot of small businesses. So a lot of small businesses are, are really up against it at the moment, particularly up in regional areas, particularly, for example, in Queensland. Yeah. So th th there's a bunch of really important questions which, frankly, it seems to me, are not being sort of addressed in a way that I would want to see them if I was a small business. Yeah, look, um, hopefully, well, JobKeeper's gone now, so... Um and I'm, I'm sort of, I would like to move on from that. Uh, I would rather go hard on income tax cuts and get rid of payroll tax. Uh, they and, and obviously lower the cost of energy, you know, make IR, IRs a tough one, of course, um, but l lower those input costs. Um, and I, I would rather reduce the amount of taxation and the hurdles that government seem to have set up rather than provide subsidies. I hate this fact that we, you know, we do this all the time in government and both sides do it. Um, oh, you know, the government, this government's handing out this much money today for this particular thing. Well, no, that's come from the taxpayers um, and maybe they'd be better off if they kept it in the first place. Um, uh, so, um, oh, look, this is all part of those reforms. Uh, how, how do we make it easy to employ people? Um, and, well... You know, I don't want to go down the COVID route, but we need to keep the country open in terms of at least internally, at the very least. Um, uh, and, and I guess try and inspire some more confidence. Um, uh, but one big thing, and this is taxation policy, and this is one of my other big policies that, you know, if I could do one thing in taxation, it would be raise withholding taxes on profits sent offshore um, to related party, so related party transactions that get a tax deduction here. So if I make 100 Bank company A makes $100 here, they pay $30 tax. So what they'll do is they will pay $100 offshore to, say, Singapore, to their marketing hub in Singapore, and Australia will lose $30 in company tax, will lose the marketing employee, the government won't pick up her his or her PAYG, we lose $100 in capital. Um, so there's a lot of, lot of wealth that goes offshore for that transaction. Now, people will say you can't have a withholding tax because there's a 17 cent company tax rate in Singapore. And I'll say, well... And, and, and it's because of double taxation. This is another group think, motherhood statement, that people just shake their head and go, bobble their head and go, oh, yeah, we can't have double taxation. But if there's a 5% withholding tax on that payment to Singapore, 5 plus 17 is 22, it's still an eight, assuming a 30 cent tax rate, there's still an 8 cent tax arbitrage on shipping that money offshore. So what we really need to do is to raise the the level of with what I call an exit tax on profit sent offshore um, to as high as we possibly can um, <clears throat> to reduce that arbitrage. I don't think, excuse me, I don't think we can get um, it as high as 30 cents 
but I do think we should have a minimum exit tax of at least 15 cents on everything that goes offshore that had a tax deduction here. Um, and that money should be used to cut income tax. You know, in the first instance, I'm not really in favour of lowering the company tax um, rate any further because I think we're in a race to the bottom and I would rather see other countries keep a fairly high tax rate or, you know, 25 to 30 cents at least um, uh, before we go any further on. I think the UK are down to 20 cents, but I just think it's totally unfair that companies, you know, we're pushing for 25 or 20 cents for a company when the average work earner, say, at 70 or 80,000 is paying 32 plus 2% Medicare, so say 35 cents. So I don't think the average worker's marginal tax rate should be higher than the company tax rate. But um, there's some settings there. And, and coming back to that onshore, offshore tax rate thing again, if we've got an onshore tax rate of 30 cents and, and subject to tax treaty, an offshore tax rate of between zero and 10 cents, multinationals will always ship their profits offshore because the onshore tax rate is two or three times higher than the offshore tax rate. So who isn't going to set up a, 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 a company in a tax haven uh, and pay those profits offshore subject to transfer pricing? Uh, it's too easy. Um, so, and, and even you look at the likes of BHP when they set up in London back in 2000, did they, you know, when they bought Billiton, the question is, well, did they buy Billiton for the sake of buying Billiton, given that it's now been spun off of South 32, or did they do that to shift their capital from equity to debt? because you don't get a tax deduction on equity, but you do get a tax deduction on debt. So by going buying something offshore and then going to London saying they needed to be in London, um, despite the fact that BHP had become the biggest mining company in the world, you know, without ever going offshore before, what that did was, in, and then they had to raise the money in London, they lent that money to Melbourne and Melbourne bought the asset Joburg, but on the balance sheet in Melbourne, it went from equity to debt. So now suddenly they got a tax deduction on interest and there's a section in the tax act that says, subject to certain conditions if you pay interest offshore you don't have to pay withholding tax so suddenly they've created a means of shifting profits offshore that they don't have to pay tax on um so that's a really big area if we want to bring back uh, manufacturing and, and more employment onshore is that we have to raise the level of uh exit tax the rate of the exit tax um like like ireland for example i don't want to go to ireland like rates because they're a much smaller country in both population and geography wise they have a company tax rate of 10 and a, and a withholding tax or an exit tax of 15 cents. That's why all the, a lot of multinationals now are set up in Ireland because they have a low company tax rate, but they can't get their profits offshore. If they do, they pay more than to keep it in Ireland. Um, now, I wouldn't propose going that low because, as I said, I don't think it's fair that companies pay a lower uh, rate of tax than the average worker. Um, but we need to have a structure where we disincentivise capital via retained earnings or profits going offshore. And a few people in the chat have suggested maybe a financial transaction tax would be a useful adjunct to that insofar that there's a lot of speculative activity, particularly in the financial sector, which isn't really that productive. And, uh, you know, if you put even a small um, proportion on those transactions, that would generate a significant amount of, um, of revenue, which could then be reinvested into infrastructure. Yeah, I I'm not against a... Um uh, a small transaction tax. I, I certainly would like to see a transaction tax on non-physical um, FX um, transfers. So effectively, you know, if, if you sell a ton of wheat, that's fine and, and, and you've got, you know, 100 US dollars for it or whatever, that's a physical commodity, that's a genuine service. But if people are just trading FX for the sake of it, I would love to have a financial tax on um, uh FX transactions, and I, I would like to bring back stamp duty on share trading at a rate of one one and a half percent, and then use that money raised to abolish payroll tax. Uh, I think the big mistake Howard made when he brought in the GST was that he got rid of uh, stamp duty on share trading, which just created a boon in speculation. And given that forty to fifty percent of the market's traded by high frequency traders, offshore frequency traders, I don't think that it's fair that a farmer or a business or someone that buys a house has to pay stamp duty, and yet you can trade these paper assets, um, albeit, um, you know, they are genuine assets, but um, I don't think that's fair. I think stamp, I, I'm actually a fan of stamp duty. I'm not a fan of land tax um, brought in on residential housing because if, the land, if you hold your house for 50 years, the price of the land could be four or five times what you paid for it, and if you're a retiree, that's hard to keep up with. But um, I think it is too high at 4%. There's no doubt about that, but I think we should always have a small tax on transactions 
to keep the speculators out of the market. I mean, obviously, speculators are always going to be there and, you know, yeah, they provide a little bit of liquidity, I think, but I think they, um, you know, we, we punish people who are genuine uh, producers at the expense of speculators and consumers. Mm. And it's interesting, of course, if you think of some of the uh, high frequency trading that's going on, you know, they only do it because they can make the odd basis point here and there. It's not productive, but it does actually create a huge amount of volatility in the markets. So it potentially yeah. could take out a lot of volatility and uh, potentially, um, you know, get the markets perhaps to be a little bit more, more balanced than they, than they currently are. Because yeah. the, the, the amount of financial stuff there and the amount of derivatives on the back of it is huge, you know, and um, we've seen a rise of 30 trillion of um, debt around the world in the last year because of everything that's been going on. We've got a massive amount of debt in the system. We've got that with a lot of derivatives sitting over the top. And then we've got a lot of people sitting on the back of that trading and cross trading all the time trying to make a turn on a turn. So this is where the financial system has become an end in itself rather than enabling the real stuff to happen in the real economy. And to me, we've got to turn that around if we're actually going to ever get the, our economy to where we want it. That's exactly right, Martin. It's the tail that wags the dog. It's the tail is wagging the dog. The finance industry is the middleman, except now it's, it's virtually, you know, the entire, uh, you know, end-to-end -end transaction. So much money gets caught up within the finance system. Uh, at the expense of genuine productivity and at the expense of genuine workers, whether it be small business or PAYG workers. Um, yeah, and, 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 and for too long, we've pandered to that tail and not looked after the dog. Or another analogy I like to use is, you know, it's a, it's a horse and cart scenario where we flog the horse, uh, the producer, who's the horse, and, and the consumers are sitting on the cart. And, you know, if, if we're going to make sure the market doesn't, the housing market doesn't crash. We need to keep people in work. Uh, and to do that, especially now that, you know, supply lines and international logistic ch uh, chain chains are struggling, uh, we need to, you know, be able to stand on our own two feet. Um, uh, and if we're going to do that, we've got to encourage genuine productivity. Absolutely. Now, I'll just make one last question on the, um, the financial system. There's yep. a thing called the Financial Council... Uh, the financial, the Council of Financial Regulators, right? That's the Reserve right. Bank, APRA, ASIC, right? And of course, it's chaired by Phil Lowe, um, the Reserve Bank there, the Treasury is there. And I've no, have you noticed how he defers sometimes to the Council of Financial Regulators that was some other entity? Um, my question to you, do you think that's an effective structure? And uh, do you think it actually um, gets in the way, adds, or is it just a, you know, obfuscation? Uh, I think the latter. Um, uh, it, it's, yeah, just another label, another umbrella. Um, it, it's worth noting that the RBA governors, if you look at the history of the RBA governors, most of them started at the RBA once they finished their degree. So if you, when you mentioned group, think before. This is a great example, and, and it goes back a fair way. Uh, nearly all of them started at the RBA, and they've only ever worked at the RBA, I think. Guy de Baal said he's not the governor yet, but um, he had six months at the International Bank of Settlements, which is hardly, you know, uh, um, uh, getting different experience. But no, no one from the private sector has ever been employed as an RBA governor. I, I would love to see someone from the private sector, from, you know, a Treasury desk, come in and work at the RBA, or even, uh, even forbid, actually have an accountant for a change rather than an economist. Uh, and those who know your accounting, you know, understand accounting will know in, in your finance will understand there's a big difference between accounts and economists. Economists work on models, whereas accountants work in the real world. Um, uh, so, yeah, no, that's that's just uh, an another label. It's easy to pass the buck. Um, and ultimately, you know, look, I think it's time the parliament uh, and, and the executive took responsibility for monetary policy again. Absolutely. So there's a common theme coming through, isn't there, that there are some structural regulatory issues that need to be addressed if we're really to get our economy firing and to the benefit of ordinary Australians. Absolutely. And as a result of COVID, I mean, we were, we had almost got back into a surplus, the, the Morrison government, uh, and then COVID came along and blew that up. But, you know, we have to use COVID. If, if, if we can get anything good out of COVID, it is the need to restructure uh, our monetary system uh, 
taxation reform and federation. Uh, it's I, I'd be surprised if I was the only one who thought that we need to, you know, we didn't need to reform those areas, and now's the time to do it. And I, I think it's fair to say, and I'd like to get some feedback from your from your viewers whether or not they would agree with that, uh, because my view is I, the people I speak to they're crying out for reform, um, and I think we need to provide it. Well, there's certainly a few people in the chat cheering at the moment, yes. uh, which which is good. Um, and yet it seems to me that that would not be the mainstream view held in Canberra, at least by the front bench. Um, yeah, so you didn't hear it from me, but, you know, ring your local member, email your local member, mail your local member uh, and tell them we want to see reform. Uh, I, I, I agitate quite a lot. Um uh, and I, you know, it's I'm going to keep on agitating um, because we've got to do it. Uh, and you know, I, I would rather stand for something than fall for nothing. Um, you know, so uh, yeah, got to have a go. And, and it sort of comes back to my mind. Yeah, I still have this model of a an economy where you've got the businesses, you know, the mum and dad businesses and the small businesses and the medium businesses right at the pointy end at the sharp end right and the rest of it is actually supporting and enabling where it seems to me at the moment a lot of it's turned on the other hand we get a lot of top-down stuff we get a lot of focus on the big end of town not enough focus on real businesses down at the grassroots level and yet that's actually where our future lays absolutely martin yeah 100 percent correct it's that individual um and entrepreneurial ship uh and motivation to get ahead uh and you know that's as i said Earlier on, I mean, that's what inspired me uh, is is the opportunities uh, that were given to us by our forefathers who turned Australia, you know, into one of the wealthiest countries in the world. Um, you know, we started off, you know, modern Australia, this is. It started off as a convict colony, um, but through perseverance and hope, uh, you know, and, and individual toil and effort, uh, we, we've turned that around. And, and as I say to people, you know, it is wealth for toil. I've said this to Josh, you know, it's not wealth for foreign capital. It's not wealth for banks. It's wealth for toil, um, and and that's what we have to get back to, um, and that's what we have to reward, and that's what we have to, um, you know, re really promote going forward. Now, I had a few people ask earlier on in the in the chat, to, uh, Senator, about um, clean energy and the future of um, our, our energy portfolio. Tricky, you know, conversation to have, but it's probably a very relevant conversation given where we currently are. Yeah, well, look, if you, if you want a carbon emission-free uh, society and you're serious about reducing carbon emissions, I mean, I won't go into the second law of thermodynamics right now, but that's a discussion I'd love to have uh, some other time. Uh, there's only one solution, and that's nuclear uh, with more dam building and nuclear and hydro. If you look at the countries with the lowest carbon emissions in the world, France, Sweden, and places like that, rely heavily on nuclear and rely heavily on hydro. Well, obviously, you know, we have some states that, can provide more hydro than others um but i'm you know if you want to you know go back to that infrastructure bank and, and the way forward it's got to be nuclear for me um yeah very interesting and uh, that wouldn't be probably the most popular policy in the country uh but there is a bunch of reasons why it might make some sense well look i'm i think There'd be a, my, my vibe is there's a lot more support for nuclear than what people realise. I was shocked to see the ABC Brisbane did a poll about two years ago, do you support nuclear or, or are you in favour of nuclear? And, and it was about 4,000 respondents and it was 57, 43 in favour of. Mm, very interesting. Yeah. I, I've done door knocking whereby, you know, uh, people will go, um, they're worried about climate change. Uh, but they don't necessarily support wind and solar, uh, but they support nuclear. So I, I, I think, and I, I, I'm a big believer, I'm going to get some polling software um, and, and put it out there. So I, I actually think there's a lot of support for nuclear. I think there's more support than what people realise. Yeah, very interesting. And again, it's interesting in the chat, you know, the... Um, there's a big polarisation. There are those saying, no, 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 we don't want nuclear. On the other hand, there are people saying, well, actually, that's probably better than coal. So it shows yeah. you there's a complexity here. But, you know, I, yeah. I think it's it's fair to say that everything should be on the table and then there should be a set of processes to determine where we head. We certainly can't stay where we are, can we? Absolutely. No, and I think everything should be on the table. And that's one of the things I find frustrating about the climate debate is the, the very people who are, 
you know, the most worried about it, refuse to look at more dams and, and nuclear. Um, well, you know, whether you like it or not, we're going to leave a footprint on Earth. Uh, and um, the, some of the de- nu- nuclear technology now is very good. You know, they can recycle up to 90% of nuclear waste. Um, so, you know, let's look at it even on those small modular reactors, uh, which is effectively, um, uh, you know, what they've been using on submarines for a long time. But uh, if you want to talk about uh, technology, and I know the Prime Minister talks about it a lot, he's going to be serious about net carbon, you know, net zero by 2050. Um, and that's his, you know, I'm not quite so worried about it, but um, it's got to be nuclear and more dams. Very interesting. And, uh, you know, it's going to be one where um, it'll be very interesting how the debate goes forward. At least um, there's a bit of a sense, I think, of, of momentum maybe starting to break out. <laughs> there's a long way yeah. to go, right? Um, now, the, in terms of specific policy areas, we've touched on the National Bank. And, yeah. uh, you know, I, I think the case for strategic investments, a bit like, um, you know, hydro a generation or two ago, um, what what's your sense of some of those? What some of those big projects might be? I mean, there's the thing called the Iron Boomerang, for example. I'm not sure where you're aware of that, but you know that that's yep. one. There's the example of uh, high speed trains, um, and and I suppose the question that comes immediately is if we're going to do some of that, do we have the capability in Australia to do it, or are we basically so deficient that it's going to be very hard to make it work? Ah, uh, look probably a bit of both on that later point. I think we do have a lot of skill sets here that's capable of doing it and certainly have all the, all the wealth, right? So, and all, and all the natural access to all the natural resources. So there's no reason why we can't do it. Um, if we're lacking, it's probably in the regulation uh, of the green tape uh, and the finance tape that makes it very difficult to get anything up and running. Um, in terms of priorities, I, I think we should go and buy back our ports uh, and railway lines and airports um, I know that might sound, you know, out there, but I think there's a serious discussion to be had. Uh, and my first port of call for infrastructure would be dams in North Queensland and on the Clarence River in New South Wales. I'm happy to look at other dam sites. Um, I think in terms of baseload energy, uh, nuclear energy, I'm not against the high-speed rail. I think what I would start with the high-speed rail is Newcastle to Canberra so that you've got, you know, the half million people in Newcastle, the Central Coast, Sydney, five million people, and then Canberra, you know, 300 to 400,000 people there. I would then look at another high-speed rail from uh, the Gold Coast to Sunshine Coast via Brisbane, link that up, uh, and then possibly one from Melbourne. Even though Melbourne's got, you know, Victoria's got a reasonable uh, train system uh, across the state, and we need to obviously improve, and I'll stand to be corrected here, so I'm not an expert on Victorian rail but yeah you, know, you could also look at then a melbourne to Wagga line uh um even though melbourne doesn't quite have the satellite population of those queensland and new south wales because it's you know most of victoria lives in melbourne um but the idea of that is you, so you don't necessarily have to build the whole thing in one go um i guess with the high speed rail um i think you know we've got to do something about fuel security i think that's a real issue and I think satellites, I know we've got quite a few private entrepreneurs at the moment launching satellites, which is exciting and fantastic stuff. I would have liked that to have been a government-owned initiative. I mean, that's a bit on the specky end of essential services, but um, (laughs) without going into too much detail, possibly a national security um, issue as well uh, with satellites and and also oil refineries. I I think that we've got to address that. Um, I think there was something else I'm thinking of that I could doesn't come to mind but yeah those, those type of issues so so i guess the observation all of those are long-term programs right so they yes. don't fit well into the political cycle right and, and the months and my question is do you think the political cycle gets in the way of some of these more strategic decisions we should be taking it does but i don't know why i think if you came out tomorrow and you said right we're going to buy back our ports our railway lines and our airports I think you'd have overwhelming support. I think if you came out and said we're going to build dams, I think you'd have yeah, you, know, you would have some pushback, um, but you'd have overwhelming support. Uh, high speed rail, I think you'd have overwhelming support. Um, uh, yeah, oil refineries, 
you know, I think there's a good case to be made. I mean, I, I don't know why anyone would argue against it. I'm sure people would. But you don't have to be there at the end, you know, starting it and, and getting jobs, um, especially if we fund it through sovereign credit, um, uh, where we're going to, you know, and, and I mean, the Snowy Hydro is the stuff of folklore in Australian history, right? And it's not just the Snowy Hydro. My understanding of it was they built Lake Hume and Lake Eldon after World War One, as well. So there's... We've, you know, our history is defined by water security and actually all history is defined by water security. I mean, that's what enabled people to have the confidence knowing that they were going to secure their feed for the season that they went and lived in cities. So, you know, wa water security is at the basis of um, civilization. So, you know, and I mean, I think Tasmania really has been the only state to, to really kick on with water um, security uh, in the last 30 years. Ironically enough, they were the state that, um, you know, had the hydro, the Franklin Dam decision awarded against the state but they've actually come back hard on in, in water projects and weirs and stuff which you know has seen tasmania boom um so i i for the life of me can't understand why we don't do more infrastructure i think it's because people don't understand monetary policy and the difference between debt and equity and and the power of sovereign credit uh or what we can call exorbitant privilege um lachlan macquarie certainly did um and therefore, it hits the finance department. So, you know, as I said earlier, the cost of the finance is what makes these things seem prohibitive, so they won't commit to it. And there's also a lot of lobbying, I guess, now by fund managers and the likes of Macquarie Bank and, and superannuation funds who go, no, 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 we don't want government building it. Governments can't run things because the, the, the private, and, and I'll be quite harsh here, but let's be real, the private sector parasites who feed off government um, handouts uh, and, and they're out there um, and they want to do scoping studies and all this stuff. Whereas if you just said, no, no, we're going to do it. We don't need to waste money. Well, obviously you want to design it properly, but, you know, we're not going to spend years doing scoping study after scoping study. Let's just get ahead and do it. Um, so there's a lot of lobbyists out there too, I think, who actually prevent this stuff from going forward. Right. Along um, with what we say about groupthink, sorry to interrupt you there, hmm. along what we, with what we say about the groupthink of, oh, no, the market will fix it. Right, and the vision thing, which is what you're talking about, right, which is yeah. painting a bit of a strategic picture as to where we want to head, not just over the three-year cycle, but, you know, 15, 20, 25, 30 years, yeah. and laying that vision seems to me the most the critical component because then people understand why we're doing where we're doing and where we're getting to, and I th that's missing, unfortunately, I think. And I don't know why, because it's so easy to sell this message because we want to give our children the same opportunities our forefathers gave to us. You know, when they started the hydro, uh, Snowy Hydro in the late 40s, I don't, I, I'll stand to be correct to you, but I don't think it was finished till the early 70s. I mean, that was a 25-year project. I mean, all you've got to do is say we, we want to give our children, we want to leave something in the cupboard for our children other than foreign debt. I mean, I, I just, whenever I speak to people about that sort of stuff, they, they love it, you know, and they love the vision. Um, and, and from a political perspective, every time you get asked something about, you know, some of the recent stuff, you can say, look, I'm here because I want to provide my children with, you know, the same opportunities. I want to provide essential services. I'm not interested in that. I want to build the nation. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. Caroline just put this up a little. I'm just going to say it again. So refreshing to hear a politician who knows what he's talking about and is honest and caring about Australians <laughs> would make a fantastic treasure, even a better PM. But the point is, it's Thanks, about Dad. the vision thing. Absolutely, it's it is about the vision thing, um, and and I think people are really looking for a vision in regards to COVID. I mean, I, I don't know about you, but I I'm and I'm, I acknowledge that it's a serious issue, but you know, I, I just, I'm tired of COVID. I'm tired of hearing about it. Um, you know, we're going to have to live with it. Uh, and, and people would like to hear something else other than just the fear side of things, you know, COVID and climate change. I just don't want, we've got to, can't let those two issues dominate um, the psyche and, and the media agenda and the political agenda. We've, we've got to, you know, be more positive and optimistic um, and, and, you know, drive inspiration from where our forefathers uh, got us to. Uh, we shouldn't be ashamed of our past. I mean, it's not a perfect past by any means, but, you know, we've come a long way in 2,000 years, baby. You know, let's get real here. Um, and we're living, we are living in such a privileged time in history. We are living better than anyone. Um, and that is, you know, you know, 
thanks to those techne- technological, uh, sorry, technological successes of you know the last thousand years, mm. um, and and we should should be proud of that. Yeah, well, I often say opportunity knocks if we did but see it, but sometimes we seem to be looking the wrong way or worrying about that financialization of property, and you know, yeah. it, we just do the easy stuff rather than the. Um, the visionary stuff on it you know I, I was a i was around i'm old enough to remember when kennedy actually spoke about going to the moon right not yeah. because it's hard not because easy because it's hard right and, yeah. and that sort of vision i think it's it's pretty important right oh look you know that eisenhower kennedy era that that is a fascinating part of history um the military in, 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 interestingly enough the eisenhower military industrial uh, speech he also mentions the scientific technological elite and how we need to be wary of them. It's worth, if you've got the time, go and look that speech up because it, it's more than just the military-industrial complex. Um, it talks about a scientific and technological elite. And then some of Kennedy's speeches were fantastic as well. There's a really fantastic one on where he challenges the media to ask questions. Um, and uh, it's fascinating. The history of, you know, I, you know I, I won't go there, but I find that... <laughs> Kennedy era, very interesting. Um, yeah. I have to say, I don't know if many people know this, but Dulles, the guy that Kennedy sacked as the head of the CIA, was put on the Warren Commission. I'll just leave it at that. Um, yeah. No, it is very interesting. And, you know, there's, there's always the argument that, um, well, you know, you, do you learn from history? I think you can. And, that, and some of the things that were done then, I think um, – uh, you know, politicians today could learn a lot. So uh, it's interesting yeah. that you you, you you see it the same. Now, um, just as we sort of go into our last sort of 10 minutes or so, there's sure. a f- few questions which have, have bubbled up and I've got some from beforehand as well. Um, so the first one relates to housing affordability and specifically two aspects, the use of super and the responsible lending obligation changes that will be coming back in May. What's your perspective on, on, on those particular topics? Okay, well, I think super should be optional. I, I've never supported compulsory super. Um, I, I would, look, I mean, I don't think we can get rid of it, but I think it should be optional, period. Now, <clears throat> for young people, having the best way to retire, best form of retirement is owning your own house. Since super was introduced, the number of people retiring with a mortgage has risen from 10% to 40%. So with a mortgage, right? So people are now getting to retirement. 90% of people used to have their house fully paid off. Now it's only 60%. And what they do is, what a lot of people do, is cash out their super as a lump sum and pay off their mortgage anyway. Um, however, I recognise that if we were to let people use their super, you run the risk <coughs> excuse me, of inflating the asset bubble even more. Hence why I think if we were to make super optional and let people... Um, access their super that we would have to cap, you know, bring in a seed capital gains tax on super, on houses above $2 million um, because we don't want to inflate the bubble any further. Number two, those responsible lending laws. I'm personally I'm, I'm in favour of uh, making it easier for businesses to get loans, obviously within reason. We don't want to see them go bankrupt, but I don't think we need to make it any easier at the moment, given that the RBR has lowered interest rates to such a low rate um, and there's been no corresponding tightening of macro prudential measures of making consumer credit any easier and or housing things any easier at the moment. Um, uh, so, yeah, not sort of uh, holding my, you know, breath waiting for changes to the consumer lending laws um, or the banking lending laws, but let's see what's in it, um, and I'll leave it at that. Yeah, fair enough. And just on that, of course, there's yeah. a interesting uh, that the um, responsible lending changes were, were sort of dressed up as uh, you know responding to COVID, despite the fact that they weren't really necessarily directly. And yeah. of course, most of the responsible lending doesn't impact business lending at all. And yet that seems to me it's a bit of a Trojan horse that's being used by some to sort of uh, perhaps some steer it in a particular direction. Yeah, look, I haven't swatted up on the on the detail detail on this. Where the business lending comes into effect is with a lot of businesses use housing 
um, their house as the mortgage to get business loans. I do know the business, I've had a couple of people contact me and say that they haven't been able to re, um, turn over their loans, um, renegotiate their loans for businesses, which is concerning. Um, and that's the only part. Look, I, I don't want to make it any, I, I think credit's way too easy in this country. I think we've, it's been way too easy for, for way too long, um, with the exception of business lending. Yep. Um, and that's where we've got to look to make it more productive. <laughs> and, and fair and efficient, which is a big generalisation there, but yeah. No, that's fine. And uh, somebody just asked on negative gearing, um, in, you know, you touched earlier on about um, uh, the the fact that uh, investment lending perhaps might be a bit too easy. So I'm not against negative gearing because if someone generally makes a loss, I've got no problems with them offsetting other income types. Now, the way I would fix negative gearing is twofold. Get rid of the 50% CGT discount on the upside and I would reduce the building allowance from 2.5% to 1.5%. So when I worked in tax, the way you'd structure a rec rental property is that you would make sure your cash outflows matched your cash uh, inflows so that cash-wise you weren't anything off and then you got the tax refund based on all those uh, depreciable items where you might write off, say, five ten 10000 in depreciation and you'd get... Uh, depending on your marginal tax rate, three or four thousand back in tax that way. So I would slow down the depreciation rates. Uh, so that building allowance on new buildings at two and a half percent, which means you write it off over forty years. Well, I've been told that some houses built today would be lucky to stand for forty years. I'm, I'm going <laughs> to say that I'm surprised to hear that. And I hope that's not the case. But I would have thought a hundred years or one percent over a hundred years. Um, interestingly enough, Keating did wind that back for a few years there in the mid to late eighties back to 1%, I think, or 1.5%, and then they ended up, you know, lobbying or increased it back to 2.5%. Um, so because sometimes people do genuinely lose money and, you know, I, I don't want to necessarily um, hold it against those people who lost money, you know, if they've got a job to offset it against um, uh, their, you know, other PAYG income, but get rid of the um, CGT 50% discount and, and just ease up on the... Um, uh, um, uh, sorry, message going through then. Ease up on the depreciation write off. Mm, okay, very interesting on that. Now, uh, somebody else asked this. This is Master Singleton. What's your take on the future of the Australian higher education sector and the possibility of a major education reform? Is it shaped right at the moment or not? I don't. I'm not a fan of it. I think that it's it's universities have become profit centres, not education centres. Uh, centres. And I think there's too much money on uh, lining the pockets of academics and people, invested interests around universities, rather than directing our children into degrees that are going to provide them with long-term employment at the end of it. Um, I think, you know, interestingly enough, you know, it's funny that the, some of those reforms of the Hawk out, uh, Hawk era, Keating era, like the Button Plan, which basically decimated manufacturing in Australia and what I would call the Dawkins Plan, um, that to me has totally... Um, uh, commercialised higher education. I would like to see all hex debt be underwritten by universities. So there's currently about a seventy billion dollar outstanding hex debt. Um, I know that there was a move years ago to tax the people when they died on outstanding hex debt. I would rather tax the university. If this person, if you're going to educate someone, you need to only offer those degrees where there's actually vocational skills um, in those roles. Now, if that means you have, go back to the old days where you have universities and institutes, so the institutes are more driven towards vocation and the universities are more driven towards research, so be it. Um, so obviously, we obviously need to support research. I wish we'd commercialise a lot more of our research rather than just sell it off to a company who then goes and makes all the money after the taxpayers funded all the research. Um, but I, I would like to see to go back to that two-tiered system where, when it was when I went to university in the late 80s where we had genuine universities and research centres and then genuine teaching uh, vocational centres. Um, and in terms of those vocational centres, they should underwrite um, uh, the cost of the degree so, you know, the student can pick up the tab. But if it's not repaid after a certain time, the universities pick it up. And that will encourage universities to only offer degrees in areas where there's there's actual genuine, um, you know, uh, employment opportunities. 
Well, very interesting. Now, there's another quick question here. Are we measuring the right things when we assess where the economy is? I'm thinking, is GDP measured right? Is CPI measured right? Um, you know, do we actually uh, need to step beyond a GDP philosophy to really set the economy up correctly? Oh, absolutely. I've always had a problem with the way GDP is measured. Uh, this is obviously a big oversimplification, but if I make a pizza for nine and sell it for 10, uh, accounting wise, that's a profit. Uh, accounting profit of one, if I make it for 10 and sell it for nine, accounting loss of one. GDP, and I know they do try to eliminate double counting here, but they'll add the 10 and the nine. Uh, so you get a GDP of 19. And you'll often hear, for example, China's economy is 70% investment, 30% consumption, or, or the Western economy is a 70% consumption, 30% uh, investment. Well, to me, I, I think that's, um, I, I don't like the way the GDP's added up. I don't like the way it's GDP, no longer GNP. Um, uh, so it should be gross national product, the produce of all goods and services by Australian businesses, not by multinationals operating here in Australia, because that can give a false sense of security. Um, you know, I well remember the ABC um, uh, uh, bit by Alan Collier years ago when online gambling was included. Uh, in the GDP figures for the first time, and it and it showed a jump in GDP because you know, hey, now we're online gambling. Um, so needs to be driven much more in an accounting sense rather than um, this sort of the more you spend, the higher the GDP, the better it is. And even our recent numbers, I think this quarter, last quarter's growth was three point six percent growth. Yeah, it sounds great, but when you dig into it, it was three point four percent of that was consumption. Uh, and you know, had that been three four. 0.4% into investment or production would have been much better. Um, so, yep, yeah, that's not counted correctly. Obviously, the CPI figures doesn't include the price of housing or existing housing at least. So that's obviously calculated wrong. Um, yeah, so there, there, there are two issues, um, you know, regarding economics. There's a few other, you know, cost gen reports and that makes some pretty uh, bold and unrealistic assumptions as well. But, you know, that's what happens in a bureaucracy. They get away with modelling. Uh, and, and selling that modelling as though it's fact. Uh, and there's very little scrutiny of uh, genuine observations. And so my question there is, where does accountability actually lie for those sorts of metrics and, you know, the way we measure things? Because it seems to me that we have a lot of people turning the handle on information, right? Well, I'm just wondering who's actually asking the harder question, which is the one you've just articulated. Are we measuring the right things? Does it give us this, the right trajectory? Um, well, the accountability lies with us, the politicians, and it lies with us in the government. Um, uh, I, you know, uh, that's that's the, the, that's the short answer to it. Um, uh, sorry, what was the second part of your question there, Martin? Well, the the, the question was accountability, and you know, yeah. who, who's asking the hard question then about oh. are we measuring the right things? Uh, you know, should we change the way we actually measure success? Because those are seems to be really, really important questions. Yeah, yeah. Look, um, it's always going to be difficult to measure success, um, you know, because there's so many different ways you can do it and different people have different views on what's success, right? Um, I, I would uh, consider that home ownership is one. Obviously, average earnings um, is one. Um, purchasing power is one. Um uh, the GDP number I, I've just got no time for. Foreign debt is another. Um, you know, and, and look at Australia. I mean, we, we compare us to Norway. We've both had booms in the last 10 to 20 years of oil and iron ore. Norway, a country of 5 million people, have got a trillion dollars in a sovereign fund. And we've somehow got, the government's got a trillion dollars in debt. Uh, and I think there's probably possibly another 2 to 3 trillion in, in private debt. Um, so... I, I, and, and I'm an accountant, so I'll look at the balance sheet first and I'll go, well, the last 30 years our assets in the form of infrastructure has been sold off, so our, we've got less assets, and our debt in terms of both private and public debt has increased. So I, I can't see how we're any better off at all. Yeah, we, we, we've got a higher um, average income or GDP per head to GDP, but uh I'm not sure that that's necessarily a true reflection of productivity, but rather consumption and, and based on foreign spending. Right. And just to, to, borrowing, sorry. Yeah. And just to follow it up, it seems to me that the private sector economists 
and all of those in the you know the finance sector and the investment banks who all seem to fixate on the GDP numbers etc are also part of the problem. Yeah, well, they're economists, so you know, it's, um, <laughs> well, enough said. <laughs> yeah, enough said. Um, the, the way that they calculate things and their benchmarks, I, I, I don't like. If you ran a business based on an economist's, the way the economists view the world, you'd go bankrupt very quickly. Um, uh, and that's a part. You know, this GDP measure is a good, um, is a good, it, it is the classic example. Um, inflation's another one. Uh, consumer spending, consumer confidence. I don't know that there's much in that sort of stuff. Um, uh, I, I just try and take that common sense view of the world. Well, you know, it, there's a lot to be said for you know the, the, the most important metric to me uh, is is return on equity, and, and there's two key points in that. Number one's equity. Equity implies ownership, and ownership implies control. So you've got to have, you know, going back to that original point I made about Machiavelli's prince you know we've got to control our, our our wealth you know as a sovereign country that's all about control right and number two is return on that equity and that's productivity and that's the ability to fund ourselves so why do we constantly need to go i hate it when i hear politicians say we've always relied on foreign capital mm. i think that's a total insult to the hard-working people of australia it's an insult to our pioneering forefathers who built this country from toil okay we rely on toil it is wealth for toil um, and we have to learn to stand on our own two feet because that's what true freedom is the ability to stand on your own two feet, in my word, uh, in my opinion, um, and, and generate goods and services so you don't need to rely on other countries. Now, that's not to say we shouldn't try and have open markets as much as possible and sell as much of our goods and services to the rest of the world. I'm not saying that we should ever, you know, shut up and, and, and sort of become the next North Korea or anything like that, but we have to be able... Um, to, to produce our own goods and services and not have to rely on other countries. Mm. Well, we've come to uh, 9.30. Wow, that was a quick uh, quick sh one and a half hours. And, and let me say, um, the feedback on the chat has been remarkable. Um, a lot of people saying, wow, you know, where, where have these ideas come from? So thank you very much for sharing your time and your ideas it really is appreciated and um i had a whole load more questions which <laughs> we haven't been able to get to so maybe we should do it again sometime if you're up for it because yeah um, I'd love to. thanks Martin. It, it's it's a really i think very very powerful conversation that we've had and um you know in terms of sort of passing messages and passing shots is there anything specific you you want to underscore from what you've said uh, look, not really. Obviously, look, thanks for having me on tonight, Martin, and thanks to all your listeners and, and the positive feedback. I do appreciate that. I, I do try very hard to get these views across uh, in the party room. Uh, I'll be honest, it's a bit hard. I, I feel like I'm, I'm probably one of a minority in these with these views. Um, but any support, you know, if you really believe in it, keep badgering uh, your local MP, regardless of which party they're in. I do think change will come eventually or, or you know, as I say, from little things, big things grow um, and, and we will continue to fight uh, for, you know, our great country uh, and for our children especially. Um, yeah. Well, thank you. And, you know, my observation is, um, and I'm relieved to see, neoliberalism is not the only game in town. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, as far as I'm concerned, neoliberalism is dead and the sooner we, we go and bury it, the better. Yeah. <laughs> well, I thank you very much for your time tonight. Really have appreciated it. Um, and uh, we'll uh, look forward perhaps to doing it again sometime soon. Um, and thanks to all the audience. I'm going to let you drop off now, Senator. So thank you very much for your time tonight. Okay. Thank you very much, Martin. And thanks very much to everyone else. Cheers. Thank you. Cheers. Well, there you are, folks. Um, so uh, really, really interesting uh, conversation from Gerard there this evening. And uh, uh, thanks for all your, your feedback, comments. i sorry I couldn't get all the questions in. I had loads and loads that I just couldn't get in, but hopefully uh, we might uh, have Gerard come back an another time. Um, to me, that's a really encouraging conversation insofar that there are people in Parliament who get it, who understand some of the things that need to be done and need to be thought about differently. And, boy, that's, um, that's good news, uh, I think, uh, whichever way you look at it. Uh, and I didn't even have a chance asking about central bank digital currencies, which was on my list, but another time. <laughs> OK, well, just as we close out the show, um, just to tell you that next week I've got Damien Klassen on from Nucleus Wealth. 
and uh, we're going to discuss specifically the economics and market dynamics at the moment. Lot to talk about there. So I think that will be worth. Uh, watching uh, and uh, I just want to uh, acknowledge a few people there on the chat who've been encouraging people to like the post please like the show guys um, particularly tonight I think this was one of the um, better shows that we've uh, we've run and um, very uh, pleased if you would like and share um, the show will go up of course in replay as well so uh, please share after that and um, well you know, we'll hopefully get the senator back on down the track and uh, continue to explore some of his ideas. And, um, you know, you're not necessarily going to agree with everything he says, but um, frankly, I felt it was a breath of fresh air. So with that, I want to say thank you very much for your um, time tonight. Thank you very much for all the comments and all the conversation in the chat. We had a good number of people on, a good number of likes as well. And uh, I very much look forward to seeing you next week. So this is Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics signing off. We'll see you next time.